7 Things IoT Device Developers Need to Keep in Mind When Developing Their Next LTE Connected IoT Device Number 2 Changed My Life Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Hello and welcome back to another episode of From the Workshop. This time at the DigiKey Resident Geek HQ. Uh, I'm your host, Brandon Hart. Got along with me this guy. Pat Sagan from DigiKey Electronics. Uh, today I've asked Brandon uh, to, to understand a little bit more about LTE technology, seven things that would typically go into an LTE product. Something that uh, is going to make life a little bit more manageable. Yeah, stuff they need to keep in mind as they're trying to develop this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. And, and Brandon started out, uh, one of the first things, uh, so if you have a cellular modem, right, and it's going to communicate with something else, it needs to be able to get there. Uh, an antenna is a very good way to do this. Yep, and gotta what, have one. <laughs> yeah, what are some of the considerations for an antenna here? Yeah, so um, the things to keep in mind with the antenna itself is the antenna only really cares what frequencies it's gonna operate over. Um, also, you need to keep in mind whether you're designing in one or two antennas. LTE categories one and up all want two antennas. Just make sure that they're matched to the frequencies that you're gonna be using them on and you'll be good to go. Anything LTE uh, M1 and lower, so basically these days M1 and NB-IoT for the most part mm -hmm. uh, is just going to be a single antenna. So you just have to bear that in mind as you design your board. Okay. And, and uh, for cellular stuff, a lot of times if you get kind of a, a large deployment, like if you had a wider band antenna, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's going to probably cover, you know, whether somebody was using AT&T or Verizon, if you can cover all those bands, you, you get kind of a safe bet. But if you had a specific, uh, like a specific use case, then you might have a way more specific antenna, huh? Yeah, I mean, if you could have a, a big antenna like this one um, sticking out of your device, awesome. You're going to be pretty well covered in, for something like that. But a lot of the antennas need to be small. They need to be inside the enclosure, maybe even, you know, uh, attached with adhesive to the inside of the enclosure, something like that. Uh, or maybe on the board itself. So different antennas for different use cases. Just know what your use case is and what your antenna requirements are as you start your development. One of the other things Brandon told me about, so if you're building something on a network, right, um, it's kind of weird in wireless technology, you don't necessarily see everything. Um, and as humans, right, when, when we build anything, part of that is seeing what we're doing. Uh, so the, the topic of logging came up. Yep. And uh, if we could hop more into that, it's a, it's a good way to monitor uh, if you have problems, right? Or Yeah, so a lot of the communication with the modem or the module, you know, whatever your design uses, um, comes through AT commands and, and being able to read those parameters and figure out what's going on with your device. If you can store that, if you can log that data, Later on when something goes wrong or you know, seems to be resetting or any number of different things, you can actually look back at what was happening and be able to figure out how to solve it. Mm -hmm. So logging is a, a pretty important part. Well, and, and, and to be able to log, I mean, that's, that's still kind of on the device side. Yep. Um, and, and that on its own is, is fine and great. But what if, uh, what if something started getting stuck in a loop? What if something started getting stuck in a loop? What if something started getting stuck in a loop? What would you do to prevent that? <laughs> Sounds like you need a reboot. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, you could have a watchdog. Oh, okay. And uh, a watchdog is uh, basically just uh, some software that looks for a check-in every once in a while from the device and, and make sure that everything is continuing to, to go properly. If they are stuck in a loop and they don't get back to reporting out that heartbeat, the watchdog simply resets the, the device or reboots the device um, so that everything is kind of fired back up fresh again. All right. So it's just a way of making sure that things continue to work in the field, even when it can't be you know, managed by a person um, mm -hmm. and the device can essentially fix itself um, by having that capability. So now these devices are meant to control and monitor other devices, such as like a microcontroller or an mm -hmm. embedded computer somewhere. Um, wh what happens if that microcontroller is out in the field yep. and uh, you find out that maybe you programmed it wrong, uh, mm -hmm. the code's off a little bit, you discover this, but now you have 10,000 of these out in the field. Mm -hmm. how, how do you get around that? Well, you roll a truck and you touch each one and you flash the firmware. Ooh, that sounds expensive and long. Okay, there may be a better way. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, firmware over the air, FOTA, as we all know it. Um, FOTA is something that applies to the device's firmware, can also apply to the module firmware. Uh, spoiler, <laughs> but uh, 
you can actually update the device's firmware, the code that runs on the microcontroller or the processor or whatever, uh, over the air so that if you do encounter one of these issues where the thing gets, keeps getting stuck in a loop and the watchdog has to reboot it, um, you know, you check the logs, you figure out something that's going wrong, you can implement new firmware, push that over the air into the device, which can then flash itself and use that new firmware going forward. A lot better than having to touch every single yeah, device. Yeah, ab absolutely. So at this point, the modem itself isn't really, it, all it is doing is just being a link to that controller to flash right, that firmware. Right, right. You're getting the firmware for the device through the modem. It's not really for the modem though. And now you mentioned you can also upgrade the modem itself. Naturally. <laughs> the next step would be to update the module's firmware. So the module is the, you know, the little part um, that is responsible for handling the communications. So on a Skywire modem, it sits on top. Maybe your design is module down, and so the module itself is the component that you're updating. Uh, in either case, there may be bugs, there may be uh, you know, fixes for, for some of the past bugs, new features, things that need to be pushed down into that device. Uh, if you build in support for module firmware over the air, or FOTA, then you're gonna be able to incorporate those new fixes as they are released by the module manufacturer. And, and that is not optional. Yeah. I wanna make a point <laughs> of this. The device for FOTA stuff, you know, hey, you do your thing uh, on your device. Building in support for the modules FOTA mm -hmm. is not optional. You need to do that. That is a requirement. And that's, uh, the, the firmware for that, is that something uh, you would find on the NimbleLink site or is that something that you would, uh, because each one of these modules, because you've got like Tele, Sequins, uh, sure. you know, all, all these different ones, Sierra Wireless, yeah. that, that you would you would be able to go to their site and pull their actual firmware off. Yeah, so if you're using a module down design, you would refer to, to the documentation from the module manufacturer. If you're using a Skywire modem from NimbleLink, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll provide you documentation and guides on how to implement the appropriate fr firmware uh, over the air, FOTA, process for that particular product, okay. yeah, for sure. Um, another point that Brandon had brought up with me, like any electronic device, these are going to need power. And uh, LTE tends to be power hungry, so yeah. um, we, we've kind of broken it up into uh, about the two amp mark, uh, because you said th these can use up to about one and a half amps? Yeah, so what we usually tell device developers is when you're designing the board and you're designing the power circuitry and everything, just try to design in uh, the ability to provide a burst of up to two amps of current. That seems like a lot. We did an episode on From the Workshop uh, all about power, so refer to that one uh, for more detail. But just know that these modules, uh, in any LTE module, um, can actually burst up to about 1.5 amps mm -hmm. in some cases, in really weird situations. Um, so if your power circuitry is designed to accommodate a two amp burst, it's not gonna be stressed when it, when it does receive that one and a half amp burst. Uh, again, those are very, very short periods of time where it needs that current, but it, your, your circuitry, your board, needs to be able to provide that during those short bursts, uh, capacitors, et cetera. Uh, there to, uh, to to accommodate that kind of thing. So design for two amps, you'll be safe. Okay. And uh, I know a lot of this, we kind of get our mind wrapped around into a hardware sense. Uh, and, and I mean, working at DigiKey, I'm, I'm a lot of a lot of what I do is think about. We hardware. do hardware too. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and when we kind of look at uh, the communication for this, back end protocols. Yeah. Yeah, the back-end system, um, it's something that a lot of people think, so depending upon whether you're a hardware-oriented company or mm -hmm. you're a software-oriented company, uh, a lot of times companies end up building one and then the other one. Uh, so they'll, they'll already have a back-end and then they just need a device that can report into it. Or um, they are developing a device and they're not really sure where it's going to report its data eventually to. Um, so my recommendation is really those two things need to be developed together. They need to develop side by side. Your device needs to know what sort of protocols are supported by the platform or maybe required by mm -hmm. the platform that you're reporting into. It needs to know how to send that data. Um, you know, can it use MQTT? Is TLS 1.2 required? You know, what sort of requirements are there going to be and where's that data gonna end up mm -hmm. after the device is built? If you don't do that, a lot of times the software platform, the backend platform becomes the bottleneck that okay. holds up the development and the, and the release of that product well after the device itself is developed. So do both, ideally, if you can. All right. Wow, that was, uh, that was very informative, Brandon. Uh, of those seven things, uh, I feel like 
you really enriched me today. <laughs> I'm glad you feel enriched. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's a, it's a helpful list of seven things just to keep in mind. There's certainly a lot more than this. Uh, and as you go kind of past seven and to the next level, you know, we touch on um, some more advanced topics and things like that. But you can refer to the documentation, refer to some of the other videos we've done for some of those. But these are kind of the first seven kind of high level stuff that IoT device developers would, would probably be well off to keep in mind. Great. Cool. Well, Brandon, thank yeah. you so much. Uh, make sure to uh, subscribe to the DigiKey videos on our DigiKey website and uh, from the workshop videos here with thank Brandon you. and Nimble yep. Link. Yep. Like, subscribe, comment, ring bells, do all the things that make YouTube work. And, uh, and yeah, until next time, have fun building.